Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to the May 4th session of the Bellingham City Council. Uh, we don't have any announcements, and that's a good thing, other than Bellingham City Council meets all requirements of the State of Washington Open Meeting Acts. Would Mike Smith lead us in the flag salute? I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Roll call. Terry Borneman. Here. Dan Hamill. Here. Jean Knudsen. Here. Michael Eloquist. Here. Roxanne Murphy. Here. Pinky Vargas. Here. Jack Weiss. Here. Thank you. Okay, we'll have our 15 minute public comment period. First name on the list is Arthur Steiger. I see you there, Robert. <laughs> Come on down, sir. Right to the microphone over here. Thank you for allowing me the time. I have a very simple request. I know it's not really simple, but it's simple from my perspective. Uh, I have shown an interest in becoming a ride share, sharing my car for ride sharing, and I went through the process that the city requires. I got a business license and step by step, and as I went through the steps, I found it got more and more difficult, and the city has made it, in, from my perspective, as a potential driver, a potential sharer of my car, has made it quite difficult to, to do that, to make that work. And I'm here just to request, as somebody who wants a part-time job being retired in Bellingham and want people within the city to have what they want, if they want it, that we start a process to make it um, a little more rational to have ride sharing in Bellingham. Uh, by a little more rational, I know it's not instant, that it's a process, but I'd like to see that process started. Thank you very much. Thank you, sir. Linda, the clock's not working. It, okay, you can keep time there, that's okay. Clarence Holmes, thank you, sir. Hello, my name is Clarence Holmes. And we are employees at Peace Health St. Joseph Medical Center and Peace Health Laboratories. Two years ago, we organized and formed our union with SEIU 1199 Northwest because we were unhappy with the direction Peace Health was taking our hospital. Our biggest concerns were the unaffordability of health coverage for us and our families, safe staffing throughout patient care areas, and fair wages that encourage retention of good employees. After negotiations came to a standstill, we gave our notice of strike on May 1st a day that commemorates St. Joseph, the patron saint of workers. It truly is the workers at St. Joseph Medical Center who carry out the healing mission of the Sisters of Peace Health. Two years ago, one of my coworkers needed an emergency surgery at St. Joseph's and has since been unable to keep up with the mounting debt of medical bills. Since her procedure, Peace Health sent her to collections and garnished one third of her paychecks until she finally was forced to declare bankruptcy eight weeks ago. This full-time employee has been working in the laboratory for seven years, and her own employer would not meet with her to work out a realistic payment plan. As a result, she found assistance at the Bellingham Food Bank and had to choose between paying for her son's medications instead of the medication she herself needed. This story is repeated across the experiences of caregivers at Peace Health. When we surveyed our coworkers at St. Joseph Medical Center in the lab, nearly one in five responded that Peace Health had sent them to collections 38% have forgone care that their physician recommended. 15% have children on state-sponsored health insurance. In 2013, St. Joe's made over $40 million in profit. Each of those $40 million is a dollar that someone in our community gave the hospital to provide them with safe care, but that Peace Health chose to keep as profit. The $40 million should have paid for better staffing or for recruitment and retention of caregivers, and it should have stayed here in Whatcom County but it didn't. It went to Vancouver, Washington as profit and left our patients and our community behind. We cannot accept that. We need a fair contract from Peace Health because we were recently rated in the top 2% of hospitals in the nation. 
but if you speak with the employees, you'll find that safe, staff safe staffing is a constant concern because turnover rates are too high and both wages and medical benefits fail to encourage retention of good employees. Caregivers don't feel they're able to provide their best care when they're spread too thin. We've held an informational picket. We've sent letters to the CEOs and the governing board. We've even published a petition that was signed by over 1,200 community members who support our cause. And now we will be holding an action to strike on Wednesday, May 13th. We're calling on community leaders like you to lend your voices when ours has fallen on deaf ears at the bargaining table. We need social and economic justice in our workplace. St. Joe's is the only hospital in Whatcom County and we are the caregivers who are there for every person in this room when they fall ill, are most vulnerable and need medical care. Management has threatened to lock us out after our unfair labor practice strike. They're choosing to pay an out-of-town temp agency tens of thousands of dollars instead of allowing Bellingham caregivers to return to work. Terry, will you stand with us on May 13th for Peace Health to reach a fair contract? Sir, can you um, wrap it up? Your time is up. We're asking all of you to support us on May 13th. There are four ways you can support us. By being there the morning of our strike, May 13th at 6 a.m. for our walkout. You can be there the following morning when we will attempt to return back to work on the 14th at 7 a.m. On the 13th at 5 p.m., we're holding a rally. We're urging you all to be there to show your support of the caregivers who will be there for you when you need us most. And we're also asking you to please call the Peace Health Administration, urging them to come to a fair contract. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. See me, Jane. Simi Jane um, uh, with Carmichael Clark Law Firm. I'm speaking on behalf of um, the rezone that's for your consideration this evening, the 801 Sandwich Way proposal. Um, a question was raised today about the outer bounds of redevelopment of the property, if that were to ever happen in the future, which we're not um, prepared to say will ever happen. But if it, just to dispel some concerns, um, your zoning code does um, have some limitations within the planned commercial um, standards and the planned development standards. Some of those went, were um, gone over today, the 20 yard setbacks, the 35 foot height limits. Um, there's also parking requirements, which really um, restricts the amount of new um, building development that can happen there. Um, and also I just wanted to point out that those are the minimum standards in the code and the plan development um, regulations does say that depending on the proposal brought forward, more stringent standards can be applied. Um, so that's always something at play when staff considers a future proposal. Um, there's also physical constraints on the property. There's some fairly steep slopes on the site. Um, the slopes range from 15% up to 40%. So that also limits the amount of um, additional development that can happen there in the future. And then the last thing that can restrict development in the future is the market. The market always um, bears on what can happen on that area in, uh, of Sandwich Way in the future. Just as now the Church of Christ is having, has had trouble finding a prospective buyer, um, that's because of the market and how churches are repurposed and what types of folks can come forward and actually reuse these buildings. So that's something to keep in mind. Um, and then the last thing I just wanted to point out, the differences between a conditional use permit and a planned development proposal. Um, there's, there's some similarities. So right now the, the property is zoned residential and conditional, there's several non-residential conditional uses which would be allowed. And the process for conditional use permits allows for staff in the city to restrict the impacts of those conditional uses through the conditional use process. That's very similar to a planned development process. So a planned development proposal will come forward and through the process, the city has the opportunity to restrict the minimum, um, sorry, restrict the detrimental impacts from a future proposal, just as they would with a conditional use permit process. So what we have here is a low impact commercial use, another low impact non-residential use, just like the neighborhood 
has um, become accustomed to over the past um, 30 years. So I'll just leave you with um, uh, another <laughs> urge to approve the rezone proposal tonight and um, I'll hand it off to my colleague. Here we are again. Hi, I'm Kate Haskell, and I'm the applicant for the 801 Samish Way project. Um, and during the last 11 months, I and my colleagues have learned a great deal about the various steps and protections afforded our cities and its neighbors. We had no idea how time-consuming, multi-tiered, and costly this process would be. We want to restate our intention to do an interior renovation to make the office, the church building suitable for professional work, like attorneys, like accountants, like psychotherapists and psychologists. We want to remind everybody that the city planning staff, the city council, and the planning commission have all recommended that our rezone move forward at the various stages that we've all gotten to come together and talk about this in the evening and during the day. We really thought the Planning Commission discussion was very thoughtful and thorough on February 19th, and they came up with a compromise position of this commercial planned offices only. After really talking through deeply, I think the um, supportive neighbors and the concerned neighbors' concerns. Um, the property has been actively on the market for over a year and a half. Three. Uh, Developers have come by to look at 801 Samish Way for single family homes, but they couldn't move forward due to the purchase price and the cost of the land. That's in page, there's a letter from the church on 408 and 409 in your packet. Uh, if it's sold in the future, as our attorney said, it, there will be provisions, there are protections, there are design reviews and permits and processes. Um, our intention is to be there a long time. Um, we think if you vote in favor of our rezone and the comprehensive plan, there's wins for a number of folks. The city of Bellingham is gonna receive a sizable traffic impact fee and taxes on a parcel of land that has been exempt from taxes for over 25 years. The neighborhood character will be retained and there will be no substantive change to that land for decades. We're gonna be working a long time. <laughs> um, churches are slow to sell and approving it tonight will prevent it from sitting vacant, especially given the vagrancy problems that were happening across the street that were disclosed at the 219 meeting. You're gonna enable a group of local small business owners to create a stable and long-term location for their offices. We meet the criteria for the rezone and the comprehensive plan and have gone through the public process. There's a compromise on the table that is a beautiful balance for all the stakeholders please pass that compromise tonight. Thank you for all your time and thoughtfulness. Good evening, members of the council. Ken Chauvel, uh, 81636. By now, I'm sure you know that uh, my wife Lisa and I are immediate neighbors to the proposal, uh, proposed rezone property, 801 Samish Way. And I wanna thank you for the opportunity to speak to you, I hope, for the last time about this project. Um, we are still in support of it. In support of it, I'd like to um, have the opportunity tonight, I hope, to uh, welcome our new neighbors, Pacific Harbor Psychology. Uh, the proposal uh, to limit um, the use on the property to office use is the best compromise, I think, um, available and I think it is it really represents the best hopes of uh, certainly uh, for my wife and myself but also for our neighbors uh, along 36th Street uh, most of whom who are in support of this we don't want our neighborhood to change we're looking forward to many more decades as Kate said of um, good neighbors and so thank you again for uh, uh, th thinking about this tonight Like that close? Great. Hi. 
Hi, I'm Marissa McGrath and I'm a downtown business owner. And um, I have extremely brief comments. I just wanted to say that in regards to the new county jail that's been in the news and on everyone's mind lately, um, I'd like to voice my support for a comprehensive plan that includes mental health care and treatment for drug and alcohol addictions. And that's all. Thank you so much. Good evening. My name is Michael E. Smith. I live at 218 Highland Drive, and I'm the uh, chair of the city's Arts Commission. And so I'm here tonight to speak to the 1% for Art Ordinance. And with your support of this ordinance, you're going to make history. You're going to put Bellingham on the map along with communities like Seattle, Tacoma, Olympia, Edmonds, Bellevue, Redmond, Kennewick, uh, Centralia, uh, there's, there's Spokane, there's many more. But the point is, I believe Bellingham is probably the largest city in this state that does not have a 1% for art ordinance. So congratulations to you all, and I look forward to your support. Hello, I'm Christopher Granis. I, uh, I've been talking with a lot of people in the last couple of months about the growth forecast that will be adopted this year for Bellingham and the county. And I was, uh, there's so many things I want to say, I, I don't know how to organize it all, but I'm coming from the point of view of protecting the Puget Sound. Puget Sound's in trouble, it's pretty much in dying and largely because of growth. Not only because of growth, but growth is a big factor, particularly green space development. I'm not opposed to growth. I understand and agree with the idea that a healthy public transit system is important for a thriving metropolis urban, and, and it begins with a dense urban core. But I'm also a neighborhood activist, and I feel very strongly that neighbors who are fighting to preserve their neighborhood character and their environment should have the last say in their neighborhood. I also don't believe that we should have sprawl. Well, sprawl is green, green space development. Enlarging UGAs is sprawl. It puts tremendous pressure on the environment. Uh, for instance, uh, the U Street UGA would be really hard on Lake Patton, which is already stressed environmentally. Well, I've been trying to think of how can we encourage urban core growth, because I haven't heard anybody who doesn't want that, especially since it is appropriate for people who want to live without cars, and for them, a good transit system is really important. It, it all comes together around that. Well, one idea I have is incentives for urban growth, and hopefully there'd be enough incentives so that there can be affordable housing in urban growth up instead of out. So here's an idea. How about uh, let's increase user fees on green space development and decrease user fees on urban urban growth. Well, that's just one idea. I hope I can think of other ones as we go along. There's only one more thing I want to say. The population trend of the last seven or eight years has been going down. Bellingham is becoming a mature city. It makes sense that it would grow more slowly. And 
it all adds up to, I'm recommending that you all choose a low growth as opposed to a high growth number. Thank you. Thank you, Christopher. Bob Burr. I think what we're going to do, I'm going to take Bob and then we're going to, we have two public hearings tonight, so rather than have them sit and wait any longer, we'll take Bob and then right after the two public hearings, we'll open it back up again. Go ahead, Bob. Bob Burr, 1130 40th Street in the Samish neighborhood. Uh, I noticed the clock is broken, but I'm not going to abuse the three minute rule. Uh, it's great to be back in front of this august body again, even though it's early May. I'm here tonight in an admittedly NIMBY role. I care more about what happens in the Samish neighborhood because I live there than I do about what happens in other neighborhoods. But my larger concern is for the city as a whole. You have three rezones in front of you either tonight or in the future, all that are in the Samish neighborhood. I am not on board with these rezones and neither is our neighborhood association. I ask you to reject all three or at least to defer decision making until the comp plan is achieved and the UGA is decided. My sad observation is that the city places developer interest above the interest of the environment. Reportedly, this council is left leaning. One would not know it from many of your actions. On too many matters, you follow the lead of your immensely developer-friendly mayor. We need a new EIS as part of comp plan considerations. To say that a 10-year-old document is adequate is ludicrous. Best science available is changed, and so has our city, this place we call home. To not consider what has happened in the past 10 years is derelict. Okay, we will now go to our first public hearing. It's in consideration of amendments to the Samish Neighborhood Plan of Bellingham Municipal Code to recreate a new 1A in the Samish Neighborhood with a commercial land use designation and commercial plan zoning designation. I'll be presenting first, Oli Taishi, AVT Consulting, 1708 F Street. I'm representing the property owners for this rezone proposal, Ashley Street Properties. Um, it's a little different, but Kathy wanted us to present first, so I'm going to go through some limited comments for you. And um, first, I'd like to thank you guys for the opportunity to present and thank staff for their work and the public participation we've had. And also, I didn't do this last month when I spoke to you about the Samish rezone that you're talking about tonight, but I just want to, for the record, be clear that I am a City of Bellingham Planning Commissioner. Um, I did recuse myself from the Planning Commission processes for both those rezones entirely. I didn't attend the meetings, or I, I left the meetings and did not return. I didn't communicate with other Planning Commissioners um, regarding those proposals. So I'm here tonight representing my client and the applicant, um, and I just want that to be clear, kind of for the record, just, just in case there were questions from the last meeting. So um, briefly, our proposal is to change the current zoning for this area, which is commercial with an auto use qualifier to commercial with a planned use qualifier. I'm to get these up here for you guys to look at. Okay, so in red is the property. Um, area one we're a part of is commercial auto. Um, area two to the south is commercial planned. Area 20 uh, to the north, 21, um, while well, Area 20 is commercial planned. Um, that was rezoned by the city in 
1996. Uh, that ordinance is in your packet, and it's it's effectively the same rezone that that we're requesting tonight. Um, so, in the commercial auto zone, you cannot do residential uses at all. There's no apartment option. And in the planned commercial zone, there's an option to develop apartments in conjunction with commercial uses, other commercial uses. And, and the reason we're asking for this rezone is so that we can develop a mixed use project, an apartment project with a commercial component on this property. Um, those uses are not allowed in the auto zone. The auto zone uses that are there today are more uh, retail and commercial uses that are oriented toward the, uh, the automobile population. It's, a, it's an older zone designation. We don't have a lot of them in the city anymore. Um, and it's, it's generally not appropriate for this site. We don't think those types of uses are appropriate for this site. Um, this neighborhood, the area you see to the east, which is over here, was actually all vacant land 25 years ago. If you look at a 1988 aerial photo of the city, there was no development there at all. Uh, this neighborhood has developed over the past 25 years entirely, this portion of the neighborhood. And it's developed with a mix of multifamily and single family uses. Um, and we think that one of the reasons that this property is one of the only properties in that area that's still undeveloped is because of the current auto commercial designation. It makes it very difficult to develop the property uh, with, with any kind of use that would be economically, it would make sense economically. Um, so that's one of the reasons why it's vacant and it's why we're asking for this change. And it's a very simple change. It's just a change in the use qualifier um, on paper. So we've uh, reviewed the criteria for this rezone, comp plan amendment criteria, rezone criteria. There's a lot of information in the record. I'm not gonna go into that in any detail. Staff and uh, the applicant both prepared analysis of consistency with those criteria. Um, staff and planning commission have both reviewed and recommended approval of this proposal. We'd encourage you, we support those recommendations in full. We'd encourage you to, to, to support those recommendations. Um, the thing I would like to talk about briefly um, is public comment. There's been limited public comment. It's been focused on particular issues, traffic, parking. You'll probably hear about this tonight from members of the public, students and uh, neighborhood character impacts. And just briefly, um, the University Ridge project, which was a student housing development, a very large student housing development, was just up the hill from this. The Lincoln Creek student housing development is just down Lincoln Street. Those two projects both completed traffic analysis for future traffic impacts. And the city used that information, that existing record, to make a determination that a reason of this property would not generate significant traffic impacts. And we, we agree with city staff on that. We actually went one step further and we voluntarily commissioned a site-specific traffic impact analysis, which is in your packet. And we didn't do that to evaluate a proposal that we're bringing. We did it to create context for this rezone. We looked in that, uh, we asked the traffic engineers to look at um, a, a development that could be done under the current auto commercial rules, which could be a gas station, a restaurant, and a retail strip, and then juxtapose that against a residential development of 75 units. We felt like that was a reasonable, uh, conservative estimate of density that could fit on this site. And uh, what you see from that study is two things. Number one, a residential development of that size will not generate any level of service thresholds, will not trip any level of service thresholds, will not require any improvements to any of the intersections in the area, it doesn't warrant it. And number two, a residential development when compared to a commercial development that could be developed under the current rules actually produces less than one half the PM peak trips that a commercial development could produce under the current zoning. And the reason we did that was to kind of show that really this change isn't going to generate a dramatic change in the potential for traffic impacts. Traffic impacts are addressed through um, traffic concurrency and things like that, and this doesn't represent some major sea change in those potential impacts on the site. Um, related to that are parking issues that have been raised. The project will be adequately parked per code. There's no credits or reductions in this area. We can't even ask like we can in Urban Village for reduced parking standard. We have to park all the units per code. Um, the project will add curb gutter and sidewalk along Byron and Ashley where it's currently a soft shoulder where people can park onto the side. That's a, not a safe situation. This will resolve that if the site is developed. Um, and potentially if there's room could also accommodate street park, like legal striped street parking. Um, and lastly, it's immediately adjacent to a park and ride. This location is right next to a huge public parking facility. And if there's anywhere in Bellingham that could accommodate a higher density of development, residential development, 
and have less impact, it's a site like this situated immediately adjacent to a park and ride facility, a multi multimodal transportation center, really. Um, the last thing I want to talk about, and, and then I'll step back, is a neighborhood character. So in your packet, I think it's page 82, there's an aerial, and I'd like to see if I can fit this on the screen. Okay. Yeah. Here you go. So this is the area. People have been talking about concerns about impacts to neighborhood character. What you're going to see here is the subject property in red. All of those developments in yellow are existing multifamily developments. There's 60 and 73 unit developments immediately to the south. There's 152 unit development immediately north of this and a 50 unit development right next to that. What you also see in blue is the Lincoln Creek corridor. East of that corridor is the single family development in this area. And we believe that that Lincoln Creek corridor, which has code prescribed buffers, creates a natural transition between the single family development to the east and the multifamily development that's occurred over the past 25 years to the west. Uh, it's a very clear barrier. When you look back at historical era photos, you can see it's been maintained over time. There's a few outlier single family homes on the west side, but those homes are actually the homes that are causing problems and they're not part of the integrated single family neighborhood. So I think when you look at this aerial photo, you can really see how a multifamily development on this site isn't going to be right in the heart of the single family portion of the neighborhood. It's kind of on the fringe where there's other multifamily development on the west side of that natural barrier. Um, the other uh, neighborhood character issue that's been raised is the potential for student population causing trouble. Um, this is not a student housing facility. It's not University Ridge. It's not Lincoln Creek. Those are both proposed by national organizations that focus on student housing development. It's owned by local developers who build housing for all demographics in the community. Um, and it's unlikely that it's going to be entirely populated with students. And you know, lastly, related to that, I would just like to comment that there's this characterization that students and renters are loud and messy and disruptive for a community. And I think that's a mischaracterization that's been presented during these uh, multifamily rezone proposals. Not all students are bad. Most of us were students and we weren't bad. And in my mind, the reality is, is that irresponsible behavior is less likely to occur in a multifamily context where you share a wall with your neighbor, where you share a courtyard with your neighbor, where you have prof professional management that keeps track of your units and complaints, and where we actually see Delta House style issues are in single family homes that are overpopulated with students, that are packed with too many people. They have lower parking requirements relative to bedroom count, and that's where you tend to see problems in the heart of single family neighborhoods where there's a house filled with four or five people. So I really think that it's a misrepresentation of the impact and that a multifamily project on this site and the reason in general will not <coughs> have the neighborhood impact, a uh, neighborhood character impact that's been presented. And that's it. Uh, in closing, I just encourage you to support the rezone. I feel like this is a situation where we have a choice as a community. We've got a property that's clearly separated from the single family development. It's immediately adjacent to a park and ride. It's immediately adjacent to services just up the street. Um, as a community, we talk about in our comp plan, in our codes, about being proactive, about densifying where it's appropriate near transportation resources, near services, and it just seems to me like this is that location and it's entirely consistent with what we're trying to do with our growth management compliance and our comprehensive plan goals and policies. So I appreciate your time. I encourage you to support this rezone and I'll be available if there's any questions. Thank you, Valerie. Okay, Kathy, you ready? Now? So the exhibit that I have up right now is in, on page 36 of the packet for those at home and those in the audience. 
so Mr. Taishi covered most of the points um, that I at least had written down for notes as well, making sure that um, the city council was familiar with the proposal before you. Um, one of the things that I am aware of that came forward this afternoon in discussion um, with the other Samish re rezone were uses. And what I, um, what staff did present um, in this uh, rezone analysis on page 76 is what we call a permitted use matrix. And if that makes um, good sense for a future reference, um, please know that it's there and what this matrix specifically does, it looks at the comparison of planned commercial versus auto commercial, um, but also because some of the other uses that were being discussed earlier this afternoon were planned commercial. This is a full list of those uses along with the conditional. So at least wanted you to have that as reference for later this evening if that's helpful or not. Um, one of the things that's quite intriguing about this is uh, Mr. Taishi stated is this uh, is one of the last areas zoned auto commercial. And um, what was really interesting listening to him for the first time is AutoZone. I couldn't help think of the AutoZone commercials, but because we've talked about auto commercial, but the way that he was saying AutoZone, I couldn't help but chuckle over there. Obviously, not everybody's finding that as funny as I did. <laughs> Um, so the history of this is uh, they thought Samish Way and the outlying areas were was going to be the dominant auto dependent area within the city of Bellingham, and we did achieve that in some of the city in that Samish Way, and that did not, however, lend itself east of I-5 in this portion of the neighborhood or this portion of the city. And even since, we have now taken that auto commercial zone and have converted it to the Sandwich Way Urban Village. So we have changed our views of what we're trying to achieve. Um, we are looking at the opportunity for more um, neighborhood commercial uses. We are also looking for more compatible uses. Uh, one of the things that the Planning Commission did do is make a recommendation similar to Area 9 of the Sandwich neighborhood is to allow residential uses as an outright permitted use. I did notice that in the uh, ordinance attached to the packet that Exhibit D will need to be amended in order to include that. I do have that that I will pass out at the conclusion that should the City Council approve the rezone with residential uses as an outright permitted use, um, you can see what that Exhibit D would be modified to. The minutes and the findings that are attached to the ordinance in the packet, which begins on page three and is in attachment one of the staff report, um, does include the reference Planning Commission's recommendation for allowing residential uses as an outright permitted use. Um, staff did uh, review the traffic study and we, uh, staff just wants to go on the record that traffic studies are not required um, as part of a comp plan reasonable process. So as stated by Mr. Taishi, this was commissioned on their own behalf. We do traffic analysis when we have project um, specific proposals and or areas that are known um, that have, have known transportation issues that we feel that we need to study in order to um, impose special um, or prerequisite considerations in our zoning table. And this area was not one of those. For the public comment, um, I think Mr. Taishi went through many of the good points. One of the, one of the items I would like to highlight for parking is there, were, there was a lot of negative comment about on-street parking and about how it takes up all the space and it actually is a detriment to traffic. And actually, parking can be viewed quite opposite of that. And it's actually one of, the, it can be viewed as one of the most efficient uses of space. It's existing pavement. We don't have to improve parking lots to provide parking. Um, the parking is, seems to be always rotating especially where you have commercial uses adjacent. People come and people go, even if it's for residential. So there are spaces that are open. And again, it's constantly rotating. It can actually be viewed as traffic calming. 
Um, it, there are actually these social tests that occur to show that you will slow down when there are cars on the road versus when there's not. And some of that is just our awareness of that there could be children coming out between the cars, there could be car doors opening, just all the different reasons, the perception that the road is narrowing. Um, so there's some advantages to the traffic calming. And pedestrians feel safer. They feel like they have that barrier. They have the barrier of the parked car that's um, separating them from the traveled way. Uh, some of the other issues that were raised in um, a few of the letters are loss of habitat and the conservation easement. And there are critical areas that are north of the site, and they are associated with Lincoln Creek. And this is on page 78 of the packet. I'll zoom in just a little bit. And it's also in the packet itself. <coughs> But there are, I don't have my mouse working. Oh, that's a good reason why I'll use my pen. Um, so there is this um, corridor that Mr. Taishi showed that goes through here. And there are wetlands associated with the creek as well as steep slopes. and the. Currently, the critical area ordinance regulates those, and those will be protected. Um, yes, there will most likely be trees, existing trees on the site that have not been conveniently located for future development, which most likely um, will be removed um, as any development um, occurs on the site. So in closing, um, Staff has not reviewed a specific proposal for this site. And staff believes that zoning is an opportunity. And what we're doing is we're placing a zoning on a piece of property that is providing a range of uses, a range of alternatives that could develop on this piece of property. We are not here to approve a specific site plan. We have learned in the past that that is not good practice because we have come back before you too many times asking you to please remove the site plan from the zoning. So we have found that it is advantageous to keep those opportunities open and staff is asking the city council to do the same this evening. And the ordinance, which is, a, which is again on page three of the staff report, staff recommends that you approve that ordinance this evening with those changes that will be in exhibit D that I will pass. And we ask for your vote this evening of first and second reading. And that in summary includes a comp plan amendment and a rezone to create a new sub area, area 1A, that is zone plan commercial, that allows residential uses outright as a permitted use. It includes adding a new narrative in the Samish neighborhood plan that is included in exhibit B of the packet. And if you have any questions. Thank you, Kathy. Uh, Michael, can you give me the sign up sheet? Is there any questions before we get open up the public hearing? Okay, thank you. We'll open up the public hearing. Of course, you have a question, Michael. Go ahead, Michael. Gene, just to, I'm sorry, Kathy, just to clarify, uh, the thing you're handing around now, this was a planning commission recommendation or a staff recommendation? Sorry. Re restate that, Michael. I don't Kathy? think. Kathy? She's been around a long time. She has a way of tuning people out. Is this a planning commission represent, uh, so suggestion sta or, or staff? So when staff originally presented our recommendation to the planning commission, our recommendation that we presented to the planning commission did not include residential as an outright permitted use. However, we did offer an alternative recommendation that staff would support should the planning commission through the public hearing process um, determine that residential uses should be or could be considered as an outright permitted use, and the Planning Commission found that residential uses should be considered as an outright permitted use. Okay. Okay, we'll open up public hearing. The first name on the list is Kevin Moore. Is 
Thank you. My name is Kevin Moore, and along with uh, my partner, Dan Parcher, who's sitting out in the rows there, we are the applicants for the project and the owners of the project. Uh, I wanted to come tonight and just give the perspective from us as owners. Dan and I have been developers and builders in Bellingham for about 18 years together, and myself, I've been in it for about 35 years. We've designed and built several projects, uh, some very similar to this in itself, and each project we look at and try to do the very best that we think that piece of property deserves to have. Um, we recently just completed a project on Old Fairhaven Parkway where we, we went through a rezone on that and several variances to allow the corner of the property to be opened up for the daylighting of Patton Creek and, and allowed the, that allowed the state then to come in and build a bridge. And, and in doing that, we thought that that was the best use for that property. This property also has very unique features and very, um, in my view, very good opportunities for what we're trying, we're proposing to do. Um, we own other apartments in the area already, and the way we've always gone about owning our property is, is we try to do the very best with what we own. From the very top, when we create a high standard and then we hire pro property management professionals that in turn have a high standard, the tenants that we get are, are very, very good. In the years, 15 years we've owned apartments, rarely do we ever get police calls, rarely do we ever get issues. We screen people very well. Um, with this site in particular, with the proximity of the park and ride, with, um, with all the different features that we have, we believe that'll be another site that will, will do very well for us. Um, just in closing, I wanted to say I have myself a family, I have a a son and a daughter. My daughter is in eighth grade, and I view her in four years of going to college. And I agree with a lot of the statements about college kids, and they can be crazy and all that. And it's a scary thing sending your daughter off to school, away from town, away from mom and dad for the first time. And I would want her to go to a place that is safe, that's well maintained, that have people that care to be able to walk down the street one block and hop on a bus if she wanted to go to school, to walk down to some commercial centers and to know that my daughter is, is being taken care of in a place like this. And that's what we're trying to propose. So in closing, I just would request or ask that you guys would uh, consider approval of this rezone and, and I thank you for your time. Thank you, sir. Randy Sanders. Good evening, I'm Randy Sanders, and I live at 4062 Consolidation Avenue. Um, one edge of our property is on Ashley, and we look out our windows to the proposed site. Um, I'd like to um, believe the earnestness um, of the uh, developers when they say that they take the best possible uses of their property into consideration, and yet I have to um, look elsewhere and, and ask the council uh, to make sure that there are rules in place in case that judgment doesn't happen to be what everyone hopes it is. And those considerations should make sure that traffic concerns and parking are addressed. I have spent a number of days each year picking up garbage that has been left by uh, the single family homes that are not used as single family homes on Ashley Street. And I've also watched school buses go up and down Ashley Street. And so the idea of the rotation of traffic um, that uh, the Planning Commission mentioned as a positive I have to look at with a little more skepticism. Um, seeing school buses and the idea of there being high traffic turnover, those two things don't seem to go well together. Um, the other thing is that the traffic study that was commissioned, uh, if memory serves, there was a question uh, when it came before the council last time uh, in this rezoning proposal 
the time of day that that study was done might not have been uh, the best time to gauge the, the high usage figures or to, to record the high usage figures of traffic in that area. So all of those things together raise my level of concern and I would urge you to um, vote against the rezoning proposal. Thank you very much. Thank you. George Sanders. Um, hello, my name is George Sanders. I live at 4062 Consolidation. Thank you for the opportunity to address the council tonight. Um, look, guys, there has been gazillions of dollars spent along Lincoln Creek below. Save those two trees. Where is Ali? Is he here? Save those two trees. Redesign your pervious surfaces, they are almost within 75 feet of Lincoln Creek. Their, their drop line and drip, drip line will probably be there. You can horse trade for, for site layout, but Lincoln Falls conservation area is going to, is still a little unprotected piece of deep woods and it is, has unique ecological values. Do not ignore the fact that this is a jewel for the future of this area and don't take your city easements right to the right to the edge of the easement when there are trees, native species. And I've, I've addressed this in some of my more detailed comments that I've made, but be careful for the ecological values here. So I expect, I expect great things from this development and I expect that we will, will have, um, have protection for our ecological values. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Anybody else wish to speak? Mr. Conboy, come on up. He knew I wasn't going to pass up a chance. You betcha. You know, this was up for a rezone about 10 years ago, 2004, and uh, it was rejected. They wanted to make it multifamily. I think Gene and Terry were around at the time. Uh, and things have gotten worse in that area since then. Got a little bit more crowded. Uh, about This area here, where all the single family homes are, kind of small ones, supposed to be affordable. Well, they were, and then the people, then the owners started moving out, and the speculators or somebody, investors started buying them. 36% of those are now rentals. Uh, and that's happened since they were built, and that's been, what, about 20 years. Uh, so the place is deteriorating to, be, to begin with uh, overall. And it's not helped really by all the multifamily developments around it, which are mostly uh, 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 populated by, by students. And, uh, you know, I like students. Uh, my wife's a professor up at Western. And, uh, but we know what can happen when they all get together. And yes, there are, there are ordinances that take care of uh, noise and whatnot, although when you call the police, uh, you know, it's always priority uh, 14, and uh, nothing really gets done. Uh, now, I sent you a packet with photos about the parking, and I was interested to hear the comments about uh, parking and how, it, uh, how it's uh, now become a, a calming device. These are the snout houses on the other side of the street from this lot on Ashley, and uh, these, are, this is a, these are calming devices. Uh, maybe we ought to use these on Alabama, uh, you know, slow traffic down there. But uh, at any rate, um, I think uh, the thought that anybody but students are going to move into this place uh, is probably misplaced. Uh, all you have to do is drive up here uh, as a family with a, you know, a small child or children and you want to rent an apartment at these, this new development. You look across the street and you see this and that just isn't going to happen. The thing is with students, uh, if you look up at High and Indian Street, uh, they, they uh, park their cars out there on the street because there's not enough parking for all those houses that have been 
turned into mini apartments. And uh, they hang on to those parking spaces like death because if they move, they can't get it again. So somebody will swoop in there and take it right away. Uh, so I don't know that there's going to be a lot, a lot of churning of, of, of the parking there. Uh, <clears throat> and again, I would, the, the neighborhood really isn't against this. They weren't against it 10 years ago. They just didn't want such a big thing. They wanted, uh, they had proposed 60 apartments here with 100 parking spots, and, and that, that was what got it defeated. Uh, and uh, we assume that it's going to be something of that nature now. But uh, so they're not against the, the development of it. It's just that it ought to be small. And as I said before, uh, during the docketing and during the hearing before the planning commission, this is a great place for the infield toolkit. We've been talking about that for years now. And every place that I think is a great place, like up where University Ridge was, and it, nobody wants to do it. And I'm kind of wondering why. So uh, I think that this thing ought to be defeated and uh, go back to the drawing board, maybe make it multifamily this time, and put the infill toolkit in there. Thank you. Thank you, Dick. Anybody else wish to speak? Okay, seeing none, we will close the public hearing, turn it back to council. Mr. Weiss. Um, I guess I would do what we normally yeah. do. Go ahead. And that would be to move uh, to have uh, at our next meeting to have it um, brought forward to the planning committee for committee assignment and uh, further review and a recommendation. Second. Motion made and second. Any discussion? All those in favor say aye. 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 All those opposed, motion carries 7 0. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen. The next is a public hearing regarding resolution declaring certain Watkin Medic One property surplus to the City of Bellingham. Peter Rafato, Legal Department. So this is a uh, public hearing to consider a resolution which is related to an interlocal agreement that was discussed in committee today. And uh, the interlocal agreement is the result of negotiations regarding Medic One assets. At the time that there was the al alternative con uh, contract structure in place for the operation of Medic One uh, between the county and the city, um, it was determined to basically invoke the 2006 interlocal, which uh, provides for um, uh, an accounting, an appraisal, and a division of those assets between the city of Bellingham and Whatcom County. So that the negotiations and the, the accounting and the appraisal work is, is before the council in the form of the interlocal agreement, but a procedural step in that process is to declare certain property surplus to the city because as part of the interlocal, there are a few items that would be transferred to Whatcom County. <clears throat> Specifically, uh, there's a 2003 double wide manufactured home located at 1886 Grandview Peter, Road. Peter, what page are you on? Oh, I'm sorry. This is, uh, I'm looking at the resolution on page 145 of the packet. Okay. And I'm looking at the fourth whereas clause, which identifies the property that will be transferred to the county, assuming the, assuming the, the resolution and the interlocal are approved. It would be the, the manufactured home, a 2007 Ford ambulance, a defibrillator, and a hydraulic rescue unit. So state law provides that when you make a transfer to another governmental entity, you have to go through this process, have a public hearing, have it declared surplus, and have a declaration that the proposed transfer constitutes full and fair value. And I guess I'll leave it at that. Again, there will be consideration of the interlocal if, if the resolution okay. is adopted. Thank you. Nobody signed up, so I will open up the public hearing. Anybody here wishing to speak on this proposal? Seeing none, close the public hearing. Turn it back to council. Michael. I move that we pass the resolution declaring this property surplus as part of the um, settlement of assets for Medic One. Second. Motion been made and seconded. Any discussion? All those in favor will say aye. 
Aye. Aye. Aye. All those opposed? <clears throat> Motion carries 7-0. Now, Dick, did you want to speak under 15-minute public comment? Go ahead. And then we'll move on to our um, committee reports. I saw that urge in your eye there. I just wanted to make it. He's got his howl hat on. You yeah, know he wants to speak. He's got his howl <laughs> hat on all the time. Uh -oh. That's right. Howling. <laughs> Howling for Samish. There you go. This Robert Crumb drawing uh, reminded me of, uh, or I was reminded of it uh, this morning when the planning committee was discussing 801 and Area 9. Um, and uh, uh, I'm concerned about what's going to happen along that, that route. And uh, that's why we had asked that these things, uh, these two rezones uh, be considered essentially at the same time. And, uh, that you look at the consequences of, of uh, proving both of them and uh, what that means for the future and what kind of pressures are going to be put on uh, the homes or the, the uh, other lots in that area. And uh, I wrote to you about that uh, earlier this or late last week and I think you already have that in your packet or you have read it. At any rate, uh, the, the, the problem uh, is that it's been kind of poo-pooed that this will, these two rezones will create some sort of dynamic. But then at the last, um, at the hearing before you a couple weeks ago, the proponent's attorney got up here and <laughs> said to you that this 801 Samish rezone should be approved because there are already non-conforming uses in the area. Using exactly the argument that somebody who is representing a future uh, buyer of the Elks Club or the Community Baptist Church might use, saying, well, they just rezoned that commercial at 801 Samish. So let's continue the march. So as Good, all good lawyers say, I arrest my case. Thank you, sir. Okay, we will now go to, what? Yeah, and I, I want to stress to everybody, when you come in this building, please sign up. Okay, sign up for public comment, go ahead. That's all right, just sign up. That's I just okay. wanted to quickly answer two questions that were raised during the planning subcommittee. Michael, you asked a question about height and I just wanted to give you this exhibit. That's the Samish property. This is in regards to the, not the church property, but the one across the street. Um, Councilmember Lowclist had asked about height limits on the site. And this is the site with um, Samish here, I-5 here. That's the section of the site that we subject to that 35 foot height limit that, that we were talking about. And so only the very center of the property would have a higher height limit. And I just wanted, I didn't feel like that was made clear at the subcommittee meeting. And then second to um, Councilmember Hamill's question about traffic improvements, I don't know if that was clearly addressed. Any development proposal for this site will have to add road lane widening, curb gutter, and sidewalk. So you'd ask specifically, I think, about sidewalk. And it's my understanding that any um, development that is of the size that would fit on this property would trigger a curb gutter and sidewalk requirement. So you'd have sidewalk extending across the full property frontage, and that would be the intent with any development. And those are just two specific questions that, that really weren't very clearly addressed this afternoon. And I would encourage okay. you to support that. Thank you. Thank you, Ali. Um, we will now go to our, our standing committees. First committee is Public Works, Public Safety. Terry Bornem is the chair. Thank you, Gene. Uh, we had uh, five items before the uh, committee today. The first item was a discussion on the transportation network companies. Staff presented recommend, recommended changes to the Bellingham Municipal Code to better reflect emerging technologies and new business models related to the for hire drivers. Uh, today the committee uh, recommended that we direct staff to bring back an ordinance that would include the issues in the staff memo. The, Waiting to the four issues on the staff memo, and I so move. Second. 
Motion been made and seconded. Any discussion? All those in favor will say aye. 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 All those opposed, motion carries unanimously. This next one relates, what? Well, actually, we don't need to. I don't Not think really. since we just we had the public hearing and the next issue related to that. But yeah, that one. <laughs> boy, that was easy. I like that. So we will jump to the third issue. Wait a minute. Hold. Oh. No, we need to authorize a contract. So I'm sorry, uh, Councilmember Borman, but we oh. still need. It, it's, oh. it's two separate things: the okay. resolution and uh, authorizing the execution of the interlocal. So. Okay, I thought maybe I got away with one. Yeah, nice try. <laughs> I know. Nice it. try. Um, let me see. <laughs> Peter's pretty sharp. <laughs> okay. Yeah. So uh, the issue was the consideration of the interlocal agreement between the City of Bellingham and Whatcom County regarding the division of Whatcom uh, Medic 1 assets and liabilities. Uh, today we did move that we, uh, how was that, to approve the interlocal agreement uh, based on the outcome of the hearing. And since the hearing, we saw no testimony against it. I will recommend approval of the interlocal agreement. Second. Motion been made and seconded. Any discussion? All those in favor will say aye. 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 All those opposed, motion carries 7-0. Okay, moving right along. An ordinance, the next item was an ordinance authorizing the acquisition of approximately 3,600 3, LED light fixtures and execution of a financing contract and related document relating to the acquisition of said uh, personnel property through the Washington State Treasurer's local option capital asset lending. Oh, I got this one. Yeah. Uh, staff presented a proposed uh, ordinance authorizing the execution of a financing contract and related documents to obtain loan funding through the Washington State Treasurer's Local Option Capital Asset Lending Program in the sum of uh, $3,500,000 to pay for the retrofitting of approximately 3,600 street, city street lights with LED fixtures. Public Works Department is planning to contract with the Washington State Department of Enterprise Services to hire a pre-qualified energy service company to perform the work. The benefits of the LED technology includes lower uh, fixture costs, longer warranties, and improved nighttime visibility and energy savings. The committee recommended approval, and I so move. Second. Excuse me. There was a resolution before the ordinance on page 187. Oh. Relating to the LEDs, also. Oh uh, boy, I've got them all mixed up. Huh? It's just a couple pages before. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Remember what I just said. <laughs> yes. <laughs> but prior to. Okay. Can we do that? Well, well, we yeah, can do we that. can Let's vote on that. Okay. So motion. I recommend approval of that one. Second. We'll... Motion been made and seconded, and we're not going to say that backwards. Yeah. All those in favor say aye. 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 All those opposed. Motion carries seven zero. Okay. okay. And the item we discussed prior to that today was a resolution in support of the city of Bellingham's application to obtain financing through the Washington State Treasurer's local option capital asset lending program to pay for the retrofitting of approximately 3,615 uh, city uh, street lights with LED fixtures. The committee recommended approval and I so move. Second. Motion been made and seconded. Any discussion? All those in favor will say aye. 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 All those opposed, motion carries 7 0. Okay. And the next one uh, item we had was the presentation of the Fairhaven Parking Task Force final draft report and recommendations. At the direction of the City Council, the Fairhaven uh, Parking Task Force convened in 2013 to develop and recommend an implementation strategy to address Fairhaven's current and future parking needs. Through regular public meetings, outreach, and public input, the task force has developed a phased approach to 
parking management strategies, which include education, wayfinding, additional bike facilities, low-cost street improvement, and enforced time uh, limit parking, long-term strategies, considered paid parking, and exploring construction of uh, street facilities. Uh, we had a pretty good discussion about this t today, uh, including uh, issue of, you know, I think everybody on the committee likes what came forward. This took a lot of work by, by the task force and staff. And the one question that comes up relates to uh, future phases of how things would be paid for. And uh, in, uh, if I can find the right page here. Under funding options on page 39 of the report, there's a comment about the initial capital investments would need to come from uh, from uh, from the city. Currently written and certainly not without controversy, the Bellingham Municipal Code does allow for city parking revenues to help pay for this type of of expenses, and that relates to. Uh, the issue that, that this council, the councils in the past have looked at the parking funds, which have all been generated from downtown parking, that that money be used to stay within that, that district and not paying for outside uh, parking funds. So we had a, a discussion about this and what we had decided to recommend, I believe, was that we ask council to take the time to go over the, the study itself and we'll bring it back to the committee of the whole to discuss this and possible uh, funding rec recommendations with a, a memo attached to, to this. And one of the things we were looking at is the idea of possibly recommending the use of bonding or some other method uh, to pay for the future infrastructure that would then be paid, repaid through uh, uh, parking fees within the district. And so that's where we'd left it instead of uh, uh, recommending approval of this to, to have the council take the time to go through the report and come back and we'll have that discussion about uh, attaching memo with it regarding funding resolution. issues, a resolution. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Terry. Yes. We will and now, that's the end of the committee report. Okay. We will now go to the planning committee and Jack Weiss is the chair. Thank you, Jane. This morning we had three different items. The first was a review of planning and community development departments 2015 and 2016 current planning and uh, permitting work program. The staff uh, provided uh, count, or the uh, planning committee with an overview of the department's current planning and permitting key initiatives. This is the, uh, the second report that we've received from the planning department. Uh, the first one a few, we few weeks ago had to do with long-term planning. This had to do with current planning and permitting. And I'm assuming that we'll have another one on uh, community development at, at some point. Um, what the current planning permitting uh, section division does, uh, they do development regulations, building permits, inspections, and environmental review. Uh, the, the report that Kurt Nabefelt, our senior planner, provided uh, the committee with information today had to do with the subdivision update that is currently being undertaken. Uh, and then a major, uh, a major effort in uh, getting uh, permitting software replaced uh, throughout the uh, throughout the system uh, this is a this is a big effort uh, our current software is is uh, not being supported anymore by uh, the vendor and is somewhat out of date and uh, we are in uh, the midst of uh, 
putting together the overall plan for, for the software. It's supposed to go into a testing phase in a couple weeks and will take for the rest of the summer uh, an iterative uh, process to, uh, to get the, that permitting software up and running with the expected uh, um, uh, timeline of around October of 2015 of when it will actually go live and, and uh, we'll have a complete conversion at that point. And then finally, there was a discussion about the, the, the lean process improvements. Lean is a, uh, a philosophy of trying to be more efficient in the way that um, companies, or in our case, uh, governments, operate uh, and trying to be as uh, effective and as efficient as, as possible. And, and uh, there was a discussion about the progress of, of how the lean process has been going. So with that, that was information only. Uh, the second item had to do with the consideration of amendments to the Samish Neighborhood Plan and Bellingham Municipal Code to rezone Area 9 in the Samish Neighborhood from commercial planned, non-retail, to commercial planned. Uh, AVT Consulting uh, submitted a request for a site-specific rezone of Area 9 in the Samish Neighborhood on behalf of property owners. Upside Partnership and the Bellingham Elks Lodge. Area 9 comprises approximately 1.8 acres and is located on Samish Way south of the Elks Lodge and north of the Community Baptist Church. The request was to remove the non-retail exclusion by rezoning the property from commercial planned non-retail to commercial planned. The Planning Commission held a public hearing on November 20th, 2014, and voted 5 to 1 to recommend approval of the changes with the addition of residential uses permitted outright as a condition. Um, we had a public hearing, uh, the council had a public hearing on April 13th, uh, a couple, few weeks ago, and today at the planning committee we had discussed the public comments and other issues associated with this agenda item. We uh, recommended approval unanimously, and I so move. Second. Motion been made and seconded. Any discussion? Hmm. Terry. I brought this uh, forward today reluctantly as approval, but as I think about it, and I think about uh, Mr. Conavoy's testimony and others about the domino effect of this area, I have to agree with them. That part concerns me, that if we approve this, then the next are those areas right next to it, and we've lost that part of that neighborhood. And so I'm going to vote against it. Okay. Mike. Oh. I th would actually like to take this opportunity to talk about all three of the rezones, because I've been Wait trying to. Wait a minute. We can, let's just do one at a time. What do we do? Well, I, I, let's do one at a time. I, I, I decide them in context with each other. Well, Peter, I'll ask you. We're, we're talking about one issue here. How can we combine two others? I don't think that's fair myself, but that's. As long as it's clear at the end of the day that you're applying the decision making criteria to a particular rezone, that's, that's the main thing you, you got to make sure you're doing. I'd like to speak directly to the one criteria that has to do with kind of consistency with our overall comprehensive plan and citywide goals. And at first I was very confused by these three proposals. It's hard for me to keep them clear in my mind and see what they were doing. But I'm actually seeing them as all very similar, as all related to uh, a similar mixed uh, corridor um, with a lot of multifamily and businesses, low density businesses mixed in together. You're getting a commercial area being where the zoning is being asked for like to a residential or a residential area where the zoning is being allowed commercial. They're kind of all moving in the same direction to this blended hybrid crossover. You can either go commercial, residential. They're all three going in that direction. And given the layout of this area, that seems reasonable. This is not one of our dense urban areas, nor is it one of our protected single-family areas. It's an in-betweeny kind of area uh, along a major arterial, and this is kind of in-betweeny kind of zoning. 
And so I know there's been much talk uh, made of the idea of this being spot zoning, a peculiar decision driven by the peculiar interests of the property owners. I don't see it that way. I see all three of these rezones together as part of a comprehensive look of this area, which is neither urban village nor single family neighborhood. It's something in between. This is kind of in between e zoning. And in this particular case, I think that the relaxation from uh, commercial to allowing, uh, this is this area nine, right? To allow currently commercial being changed to commercial planned now, right? Which would allow some residential uses to be permitted. And I believe the recommendation was an actually adding provision for residential uses permitted outright. Is that correct? So, I mean, I see this as, as tending in the same direction as some of the other proposals, and I see that direction as uh, appropriate to the character um, of this part of the city. Okay, thank you, Mike. Anything else? All those in favor of the motion will say aye. 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 All those opposed? Aye. Motion carries 6 1. Go ahead, Jack. The last item that we had in the planning committee was the consideration of amendments to the Samish Neighborhood Plan and Bellingham Municipal Code to rezone. 801 Samish Way in Area 4 of the Samish Neighborhood from residential single to commercial planned office uses only. Pacific Holding, Harbor Holdings requested amendments to the Samish Neighborhood Plan and Bellingham Municipal Code to rezone 801 Samish Way in Area 4 of the Samish Neighborhood from residential single to commercial planned non-retail. 801 Samish Way comprises approximately 1.9 acres and is located east of Area 9 in the Samish neighborhood and south of the Ridgemont Village condominiums. This property would become Area 10 of the Samish neighborhood. The applicant proposes to utilize the site's existing building for a psychology practice. The Planning Commission held a public hearing on February 19, 2015 and voted 4 to 2 to recommend approval of the change with the provision that only office uses be permitted in this area. As the item before, we had a public hearing on April 13th, 2015, a couple weeks ago. And um, as the item before, we, the Planning Committee uh, discussed this and uh, we ended up having a mixed recommendation on a two to one vote uh, to approve and I will move approval. Second. Motion been made and seconded. Any discussion? Terry? Yeah. Yeah, I was the dissenting vote on this one. I went in thinking, yeah, I'm going to support it. This, the idea of a psychology practice going in sounds, sounds like a reasonable thing. And, and since it would be office, but, it, but the, it was, it's offices, not office. And that threw me. This is a piece of property close to two acres which under the current proposed use is just fine. But it doesn't, we're not approving the current use. We're approving the rezone of a piece of property and what the potential can be. And the potential for that is a number of offices on that property, not just the one practice, which makes a difference for me on that. And and when I realized that that is how it can be used as opposed to just what the current use is proposed, because we're not voting on that psychology practice. We, that's not, this is a rezone. And so because of that, I uh, voted against it and I will tonight. Okay, motion been made and seconded. All those in favor of the motion will say aye. 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 All those opposed? Aye. Motion carries 6-1. Thank you very much, Jack. Now we go to Community and Economic Development. Pinky is the chair. Uh, no, actually Oh, I'm sorry. Michael Lilliquist is the chair. Thank you, Jean. Her, her pink uh, radiance just overcomes Pinky me. actually is on the committee, so I can throw you when she's there. Uh, we had several items before. I think it was actually four items before us. The first of those is a resolution authorized in 2015 HUD annual action plan. The 2015 annual action plan is required by HUD, a federal agency, uh, to guide the allocation of federal community block grant and home investment partnership funds received by the city. However, with the passage uh, in 2012 of a Bellingham housing levy, 
The decision was made to integrate the 2015 action plan process, so our own local funding, which is now much larger than the federal funding, along with the federal funding for a unified action plan on the housing and social services front. The city announced the availability of funding opportunities through six competitive notices of funding availabilities, or NOFAs. This is in six different kind of areas. 41 applicants, uh, amounting to over 6.1 million in requests, were received and considered. Our Community Development Advisory Board held a public hearing and ranked all the proposals, and this is for their recommendation on to the mayor and council for consideration. And so in the, we have a resolution before us, and. Uh, the resolution is to adopt exhibits A and B, which reflect the recommendations of CDAB as to how to use the monies. It has both the federal monies, city's own general fund dollars, as well as the housing uh, levy dollars in there. This afternoon, the committee unanimously uh, recommended approval of the resolution to adopt the plan, and I so move. Second. Motion been made and seconded. Any discussion? All those in favor will say aye. 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 All those opposed? Motion carries 6 0. Jack left the room. Oh, uh, before we go on, um, one of the largest unspent parts so far of the housing levy is on the housing production component. These are getting production going is much harder than some of these programs. So we actually have several million dollars that's sort of in the pipeline are waiting for opportunities. But even given that, the current amount of housing units produced, as long as well as the ones that are contracted to be produced already, is already meeting or exceeding our seven-year goal for the entire program. So that bodes well. We haven't spent the majority of our money, and we've already met that target. Uh, we're leveraging the dollars really well, or we just didn't predict things very well. <laughs> I don't know. It's good news either way. Uh, the next one is a simply titled ordinance called 1% for the Arts Ordinance. Uh, the 1% for the Arts Ordinance was a draft at the request of the City Council. Actually, it was proposed by the Arts Commission to us. That ordinance is drafted to implement a 1% for the arts program. This program would require city projects adopted in the capital facilities plan of an estimated cost of over $2 million to set aside 1% of the eligible funds for the incorporation uh, of artwork into the project or the purchase of public artwork to be included in it. So in a $2 million project, we're talking about a $20,000 $20 embellishment or artistic feature through uh, um, and as was explained by Mr. Smith earlier, this actually is already part of the state and many other cities. We've actually done this informally in other cases. Uh, we formalize the ordinance as very straightforward. We exempt certain projects where it's legally impossible. We exempt underground pipes. We don't include artwork with the pipes. Um, this afternoon, the committee unanimously recommended approval of the ordinance, and I, I so move. Second. Motion be made and seconded. All, any discussion? All those in favor say aye. 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 All those opposed? Motion carries 6 0. Yay. Yay. <laughs> the third item uh, was a discussion of urban village redevelopment incentives. The City Council has directed staff to compile a list of current and potential redevelopment incentives for targeted geographic areas. This is for urban villages only or for forms of development like affordable housing uh, uh, and develop recommendations for expanding or improving or implementing these incentives. These recommendations have been drafted for review in our packet and this meeting was a work session to discuss those incentives. The staff memo broke it down into, well, nine areas and we got through, I think, five of them, although we kind of jumped forward to a sixth one. We did not complete our discussion. Uh, I think there was a genuinely uh, favorable impression of the incentives by the committee members, but we didn't finish the discussion. That will uh, be brought forward to another committee meeting for completion of the discussion. I don't know if committee members want to give any more comments on that. Okay. So the final item was a presentation of the economic contribution of outdoor recreation study. Oh, someone should fix the pros on that. <laughs> we presented a study entitled The Economic Contribution of Outdoor Education to Our Local Economy. The presentation provided a synopsis of a newly released economic contribution of outdoor recreation study. The study, by the way, the state actually commissioned a study by the same company to do this economic analysis, and the same company was then supported by city dollars, uh, county and port, and uh, I think it's also tourism commission dollars. Uh, to, to have a own local Watkins specific uh, sub-study done on our behalf. Um, and this had basically three areas that were investigated. 
Uh, one is direct recreational expenditures in Whatcom County. There uh, is estimated to be $705 million in recreational spending in Whatcom County each year. This is by locals as well as by visitors. Some of that money does go out of state, um, but uh, I think it was over $585 million of that uh, stayed locally, and that helps support 6, 000, an estimated 6,500 jobs. So this is your boating center, this is your Mount Baker ski area, this is, you know, you know, all those things like that. In addition, another area that was uh, assessed um, was recreational uh, businesses. So this is not spending per se, this is the businesses themselves. There are uh, 279 recreation-related businesses in Whatcom County that uh, uh, provide an estimated 3,700 jobs and another another $508 million in revenue from those recreation businesses. And then a final third point uh, of the study was an attempt to put a dollar value on the value of the preserved natural systems for recreation, the ecosystem value, the aesthetic value, and uh, that number was uh, very large, uh, six to ten billion dollars is the value that accrues to our uh, county because of our improvements to our quality of life, to the health of our water, the health of our woods, the health of us, uh, and uh, other such benefits like that. Um, one of the other uh, interesting findings is in the state, uh, people are outdoors and recreating about 59 days a year. It's about a third higher in Whatcom County, 78.1 days of recreation on average in Bellingham. So half of us are actually out more often than that. Um, that was the report. I just want to say one more. This is for information only, uh, for us to help understand this important part of the local economy. And I would like to thank uh, Todd Ellsworth and April Claxon of Recreation Northwest, who uh, the, the report was presented, uh, developed for and presented by to us. And that's the end of the report. Thank you, Michael. We will now go to committee hall. We had five items. The first item was an annual update from Bellingham Whatcom County Commission Against Domestic Violence. This afternoon we got a real great sideshow, a sideshow, I'm sorry, slideshow <laughs> from, it's been a long evening, it's only 8.30. <clears throat> an annual, uh, a slideshow from, see, Susan Mark, she speaks too fast, that's why I'm talking. Anyway, it was a great report. Uh, it's always interesting to hear her report, and we're very lucky here in the county to have such a great commission against domestic violence. We're making great headway there. The next is an ordinance amending Bellingham Chapter 10.28, Bellingham Municipal Code, to authorize voluntary compliance agreements with property owners where the violation does not create an intimate risk of harm to public health or safety. This afternoon, uh, we heard uh, we heard this ordinance read, and the committee recommends approval, and I so move. Second. Motion been made and seconded. Any discussion? All those in favor will say aye. 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 All those opposed? Motion carries 7-0. The next was a discussion of the proposed new Whatcom County Jail. This afternoon we heard from Peter Rafato and Mayor Kelly on uh, their uh, negotiations with the county. We had a very lengthy report, and at the end of the report, the motion was made to move that the administration present the entire memorandum from the packet to the county executive so that our questions can be answered, and I so move. Second. 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 Motion been made and seconded. By the council. Yeah, yeah by everybody. Gene. Oh, I'm sorry, Brian. Go ahead. Brian Under Heinrich, the Mayor. discussion. Go ahead. I'm sorry, Brian That's Heinrich, right. Mayor's Office. I just wanted to correct some information I told the mayor earlier today during the session. August 4th is the last date that a council can send an item to the ballot. So I think for all intents and purposes, it would probably require a July vote for either either body to, to do that. If they this were afternoon, so she said the count, are they they're talking about it on the 12th, but are do they anticipate voting on it that night? We we don't know. Do we? we don't know. We don't have a, okay. Okay. Any further discussion? All those in favor will say aye. 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 All those opposed. Motion carries 7-0. We will now have the evening minutes of, we'll do these separately, April 13th. Move approval. Second. Motion been made and seconded. Any discussion? All those in favor will say aye. 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 All those opposed? Motion carries 7-0. Now we, we need a motion for April 20th. Move approval. Second. Motion been made and seconded. Any discussion? 
All those in favor say aye. 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 All those opposed? Abstentions? Aye. Motion carries 502. Any old or new business? Roxanne. Well, again, I just wanted to report out that it was an absolute honor to MC the event, the event where author Timothy Egan visited our community and the Mount Baker Theater was packed with 1,325 individuals. Mr. Egan wrote a book about Edward Curtis. Mr. Curtis was a photographer that took portraits of Native Americans from 80 tribes. And the reason I bring this up again is that I hope everybody will visit the Whatcom Museum because so much of Mr. Curtis's work is now on display. This was a really special event to host and it's a really great series for anybody to check out. So please visit the Whatcom Museum and many thanks to the Bellingham Public Library and all of the other sponsors for hosting that free event. Dan, you had some? Yeah. <clears throat> Um, last Monday, I was able to go on a ride along with the community paramedic program, thanks to Chief uh, Newbold uh, making that decision to, to allow for that. Um, Nothing. Okay. I'm sorry. Go ahead. <laughs> That's okay. I just wanted to, I, I did a little write up. I just wanted to pr uh, provide a, a piece of that here tonight. Uh, the program that um, paramedic Rob Stevenson operates is a mobile triage of sorts, managing care for patients mostly right in their own homes. He works with a network of referring agencies that provide case management for some of our community's most vulnerable residents. Throughout the day, he manages near-term physician visits, conducts health assessments, and provides physical and mental health advice, and he listens a lot. <clears throat> Back at the station, um, volunteer Ryan Moore showed me the data that he's been collecting and analyzing about frequent users of emergency services. High service users account for a tremendous amount of time and resources resources for mostly non-emergency calls, stressing a system that has to be ready to respond to bursts of activity at a moment's notice. The graphs are illuminating. There are several chronic 911 utilizers that have completely ceased calling 911 after just one or two visits from Stevenson. He educates them and gets them connected to healthcare that better meets their needs. This allows the emergency system from responders to dispatch to record keepers to focus on critical care for those who need it most in our community. And to me, the takeaway was clear. This program provides an opportunity to create patient-centered care, both utilizing and enhancing the safety net for those who would otherwise likely end up at the emergency department at the hospital. In looking system-wide, we all save when we invest in prevention and intervention programs. It's common sense, and I just wanted to thank the chief here tonight for allowing me to do the ride along. Thank you, Dan. Pinky. I'm chair of the ILTAC committee, and I just wanted to report out that we had 18 events, uh, sorry, 18 submissions for the signature event. Uh, we did cho choose one, and it is a Bellingham Waterfront and Seafood Festival, and we are in negotiations with them on that contract. So we're very excited about a connection to our bay. And then one other thing I just wanted to mention is lately we've been having a lot of Western students who have been coming to our uh, to our council meetings and I really want to appreciate you for coming and realize that tonight um, some comments were made and I wanted to address them. Uh, just because you're young and you're exuberant and probably don't have a lot of money does not mean that you're troublemakers <laughs> and, uh, and that sometimes it will you, many of you will have to room together and that's okay. We all had to do that as students and most of the students that I've been working with in Western through my council duties and through my, um, through my job at PSC have been wonderful. And uh, I just want to rec um, recognize you for coming to council and just ignore all those other things. <laughs> <laughs> thank you for coming. Okay, thank you very much. Um, we didn't have any executive session items this afternoon, so we'll now go to the mayor's report, Brian. Thank you, Brian Heinrich, Mayor's Office. Hold on one second, I apologize. Mayor's asking for a couple of approvals. Uh, James York and Megan Lee to the Greenway Advisory Committee. Fair move. Cool. Second. second. Motion been made and seconded. Any discussion? All those in favor say aye. 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 All those opposed, motion carries 7-0. Mayor will reappoint Stephen James as the Puget Neighborhood Primary Representative and Kate Nichols as the Happy Valley Neighborhood Primary Representative. Uh, both, the, uh, both of those are to the Mayor's Neighborhood Advisory Commission. 
That's information only. Also, the mayor will appoint Nina Talbot, Sherilyn Myers, and reappoint Meredith Ross and Karen Stewart to the Bellingham Sister Cities Advisory Board. And then I just wanted to just quickly a uh, couple of things. The Revitalize Washington 2015 is the Washington Trust for Historic Preservation. They're having their annual conference. It'll start this Wednesday. Many, if not all, of those events are at the Mount Baker Theater, so we're happy to have them here. And then also wanted to let you know that the training program for Access Bellingham, the first class is tomorrow. There are 16 uh, people registered for 10 slots. So oh, uh, I know Arrow Johnson will do a great job of uh, fitting them in. He's very excited and, uh, and relays that there's a lot of interest and he's, he's looking forward to getting started. So I'll certainly keep you apprised as that progresses. And um, I know council directed and, and, and we worked really hard on getting uh, or making sure that the content that they produce will end up on BTV 10. So I would anticipate in the coming weeks that we will start to see much more content. Okay, thank you, Brian. Consent agenda? Move approval. Second. Motion been made and seconded. Any discussion? All those in favor will say aye. 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 All those opposed, motion carries 7 0. Final consideration of ordinances. I lost my pen. Hmm. Well, we had a little issue. Um, the electronic version of the ordinances is, is correct, but when we send the PDF to the printer, um, their program couldn't read the font that it was in. So we had a little problem there. So. Even though the online version is correct, I'm going to read changes that were supposed to be printed in the agenda packet on two of the ordinances. The first one, there's no issue with. Um, so it's Agenda Bill 20801, an ordinance relating to the 2015-2016 biennial budget Reconciling the differences between budgeted, estimated 2015 beginning reserve balances and actual 2015 beginning reserve balances and placing the differences in the ending reserve balances for a net increase of $45,574,784. Move third and final. Second. second. Motion been made and seconded. Roll call. Jack Weiss. Aye. Terry Borderman? Aye. Dan Hamill? Aye. Jean Knudsen? Aye. Michael Lilliquist? Aye. Roxanne Murphy? Aye. Pinky Vargas? Aye. Ordinance passes 7 0. On Agenda Bill 20802, on page 558 of the agenda packet, Section 10, the sum of 64,232.22 is replaced by 47,777 and 22 cents. And then just a couple lines down for the estimated ending restricted reserve, the 64,000 is again replaced by the $47,777.22. On the next page, page 559 of the agenda packet, right up at the top, the, line, the first line that starts with fund 172 for land acquisition costs, that was a typo and should have been fund 173, so that whole line comes out. In section 11, just below that, the sum of $314,568.55 is replaced by $331,023.55. And just a couple lines down <clears throat> for the total for estimated ending reserve, restricted reserve, 
the 314,568.55 is again replaced with $331,023.55. Then that line that we deleted up at the top, just before section 12, the line will now read 173-5472-6196102 land acquisitions cost for $16,455 with a total of $331,023.55. And again, we did have all that we thought put together, but it didn't print. Are there any questions? Nope. Okay. I'm not going to ask you to repeat it either. <laughs> Thank you. So the title for Agenda Bill 20802, an ordinance relating to the 2015 budget appropriating $11,751,064.84 in additional funds to pay for goods and services ordered in 2014 but unpaid at year-end closing from revenue and estimated ending reserve balances. Move third and final. Second. Motion be made and seconded. Any discussion? Roll call. Terry Borneman. Aye. Dan Hamill. Aye. Jane Knudsen. Aye. Michael Eliquist. Aye. Roxanne Murphy. Aye. Pinky Vargas. Aye. Jack Weiss. Aye. Ordinance passes 7-0. So we have the same thing happen on Agenda Bill 20803. This one isn't quite so complicated. <laughs> uh, on, the, on the title, the amount right at the end of the first line, $53,115,961, is replaced by $53,154,416. And then what would be page 578 of the agenda packet for section 10, just a few lines in, um, the sum of $42,900 is replaced by $81,355. And the total, <coughs> excuse me, for that section, the estimated ending restricted reserve of 42,900 is replaced by $81,355. And then down in the next uh, section, the Beyond Greenways Fund, the uh, last line, sidewalks, paths, and trails, that 22,900 is replaced by $61,355. And the total of 42,900 is replaced by $81,355. Okay. Okay. Agenda Bill 20803, an ordinance relating to the 2015 budget appropriating $53,154,416 from estimated reserves and outstanding revenue pay for goods and services that were authorized in 2014 but were not obligated by purchase order or contract by year end and placing $949,015 in estimated ending restricted reserves. Second. Most been made and seconded. You know, the, for, for those of you that remember Quick Draw McGraw, the cartoon, you remember that? <laughs> Brian, forget it. Um, <laughs> you're getting to be Quick Draw McGraw on these seconds and motions, <laughs> isn't she, huh? Okay, go ahead. Roll call, then. Uh, uh, Dan Hamill. Aye. Jean Knudsen. Aye. Michael Lilquist. Aye. Roxanne Murphy. Aye. Pinky Vargas. Aye. Jack Weiss. You know, I'm all choked up. This is going to be my last reappropriation vote. <laughs> really? It is? <laughs> Aye. Meeting adjourned on that one. Oh, wait a minute. Excuse Aye, me. Terry. <laughs> okay. Cut cut me. The next meeting of the Bellingham City Council will be May 18th. Meeting adjourned. You remember that cartoon? I do. I'm